Bundy, Gacy, Manson. But how many people have heard of Jane Tophan, a nurse and the daughter of Irish immigrants? This angel of mercy is believed to have been one of America's most prolific poisoners, having killed over a hundred patients. The first generation Irish nurse was known for her cheerful, funny demeanor, hence her nickname, Jolly Jane. It has been said that she was one of the most notorious female poisoners in modern times. Jane Toppin wasn't even her real name. She was born as Nora Kelly in Boston in 1854 to Irish immigrants Bridget and Peter Kelly. He was known as Kelly the Crack, short for Crackpot. He was said to have been committed to an asylum when he was found in his shop, having sewn his eyelids together. In 1860, only a few years after his wife's death, Kelly took his two youngest children, eight-year-old Dahlia Josephine and six-year-old Nora, to the Boston Female Asylum, an orphanage for indigent female children. When the board examined the shabby dress and poor hygiene of the young girls, it was decided that these children have been subject to neglect and possible abuse. The vote was unanimous to allow the children to stay at the asylum. No records exist of Dahlia and Nora's experiences during their time in the asylum, but reportedly Dahlia became a sex worker, while their older sister Nellie, who was not committed to the orphanage, was committed to an insane asylum. In November 1862, less than two years after her father had left them, Nora Kelly was placed as an indentured servant in the home of Mrs. Ann C. Toppin of Lowell, Massachusetts. Even though she was never formally adopted, she changed her name to Jane Toppin. Jane suffered shame and humiliation at the hands of her foster mother. Although Anne's daughter Elizabeth never mistreated Jane, Jane developed a bitter hate and jealousy for her foster sister. Most of all, Jane envied the fact that Elizabeth would eventually get married one day. In order to overcome this abuse, Jane developed a vivacious personality and denied her Irish heritage by making derogatory anti-Irish and anti-Catholic statements in the Protestant circles in which she moved. While some of her schoolmates liked her a great deal, others despised her as an outrageous liar. She spun tales of her heritage and would often pin her troublesome deeds on other children. Jane began nursing training at Boston's Cambridge Hospital. She was quite popular with the patients and acquired the nickname Jolly Jane, but her colleagues were not as taken with her. She was not well liked by her fellow trainees and was perceived as a deceivious gossiper that repeatedly lied about her background. She was suspected of stealing, but she was never caught. If she liked a patient, at first she would falsify their charts or give them small doses of medicine to make them so they would have to stay. At first, Toppin merely experimented with patients at Cambridge Hospital. She would test different levels of morphine and other narcotics on the unwilling patients. She began conducting scientific experiments on her patients, in which she would alternate different doses of morphine or atropine to examine the effects on the patients. She claimed this was only to test their nervous system's responses. Soon, however, these awful tests led to murder. Toppin began giving patients strychnine, rat poison, rather than simply increasing morphine dosages. She grew to like atropine because of the more animated symptoms they were associated with. It is speculated that Jane killed more than a dozen of her patients while working at Cambridge. One patient, Mrs. Emily Feeney, lived later to tell the tale of Jane's maliciousness. After surgery, Jane administered some bitter tasting medicine to Amelia to help her with her pain. As she was slipping into unconsciousness, she realized that Jane had gotten into bed with her and began kissing her all over her face. Luckily for Mrs. Feeney, Jane was startled by somebody and hastily left the room. As Amelia gained consciousness the next day, she thought the incident had all been a dream and she checked out of the hospital, keeping her fears silent until she found out that Jane had been arrested. 1901. Even though her colleagues didn't like her, she won the favor of a couple of doctors who gave her glowing recommendations to receive wider training at the more respectable Massachusetts General Hospital. Jane had such a jolly air at Massachusetts General Hospital. In fact, patients who were not murdered liked Jane a great deal. 
the head nurse's leave of absence, Jane was named a temporary representative. Colleagues disliked her and suspected that she was using blatant disregard for the dosages of medication she was giving her patients. Quite a few of her patients were speculated to have died under her care. That summer, Jane broke an important rule and left the ward without permission. She was discharged without ever receiving her nursing license even though she had passed the final and her diploma was signed. Upon her dismissal, Toppin became a private nurse and continued her lethal ways. Jane was regarded as the most successful private nurse in Cambridge, even though some of her employees were annoyed with her intricate lies and petty theft. In her free time, Jane loved to guzzle beer, tell lies, and spread rumors. Jane poisoned her landlord, Israel Dunham, because he was feeble and fussy. Jane then moved in with her dead landlord's wife, Lovey. Her foster sister, Elizabeth Brigham, met her at a vacation home at Cape Cod. Jane slowly poisoned her and claimed that this was the first victim that she hated. She told Elizabeth's widower, RML, that it was her sister's last wish to have Jane have her gold watch and chain. Aramel obliged because this sounded characteristic of his dear wife Elizabeth and later found out after Jane was arrested that she had pawned the gold watch and chain. Jane then poisoned Mary McLear after she was recommended by the woman's doctor to take care of her. It was speculated that Jane took some of Mary's clothing. This murder was odd because Jane did not know Mary personally and she liked to kill people she knew. On February 11, she killed old friend Myra Connors with strychnine in order to take over her position as dining matron at the theological school. After Myra died, Jane approached the dean of the theological school and informed him that Myra was planning on going on a sabbatical and she had intended to recommend Jane for the job. Jane lied to the dean and told him that Myra had instructed her on all the duties of the job. The dean offered her the job right from the start, her co-workers questioned her competence. Jane began living under new landlords, Melvin and Eliza Beadle, whom she also poisoned, but only enough to give them gastrointestinal illness. She poisoned the Beadle's housekeeper, Mary Sullivan, enough to frame her as a drunk, as she would be dismissed and she could take over. It worked. The landlord of the cottage where Jane vacationed decided that it was time to collect on the $500 she owed them. So Mary, Maddie, Eldon embarked on a trip to the Beatles' house in Cambridge. Jane gave Maddie some doctored mineral water and later that evening gave her more morphine when she became sick. Over seven days under the noses of everyone, even a doctor who had been successful in catching another woman serial killer who used arsenic, Jane poisoned her victims slowly. She played with Maddie, bringing her in and out of lucidity only to immediately plunge her into a deep coma. Maddie Davis finally died. She also poisoned Genevieve Gordon, the youngest Davis daughter who had remained in the house. Jane tried to pass it off as a suicide due to the fact that Genevieve was distraught over her mother's death. Jane then turned her sights on Eldon Davis and killed him in less than two weeks after his youngest daughter's death. Jane then returned to her hometown of Lowell in hopes of marrying her dead foster sister's widower, Armel Brigham. Jane killed his sister, Edna Bannister, because she felt she was in the way of her marriage to Armel. Minnie Gibbs' father-in-law, Captain Gibbs, summoned Leonard Wood, the leading toxicologist in Massachusetts, to exhume the bodies of the Davis family to test his suspicions that they have been poisoned. Jane read this in the newspaper. When the bodies were exhumed, a state police detective, John S. Patterson, was assigned to follow Jane and keep an eye on her. Jane was eventually arrested for the murder of Mimi Gibbs. Arraignment was held for Jane. The trial continued until November 8, 1901. Jane pleaded not guilty. The state proposed that Jane had been using arsenic to poison her victims because it had been found in the bodies. It turned out that the embalming fluid used was mostly arsenic and the prosecution was at a standstill about how Jane had killed her victims. November 8th, trial was continued to November 11th. The prosecution was still no closer to connecting Jane to the victims. It was old Captain Gibbs, Mimi Gibbs' father-in-law, who proposed that Jane had used morphine and atropine as her poisons of choice. An inquisition hearing about the deaths of the Davis girls was held after Jane's hearing, and Captain Gibbs' suspicions 
were found. December 6th, 23 members of a grand jury assembled to hear Jane's case. Jane was officially charged with four counts of murder on the entire Davis family. Once again, she pleaded not guilty. Trial once again continued until December 11th, when the bodies of Maddie and Alden Davis were exhumed. March 31st, papers reported that Jane had undergone a psychiatric evaluation by a panel of experts who have determined that she was insane. Jane had admitted that she had an irresistible sexual impulse to kill and she confessed to 11 murders. June 23rd, the trial of Jane Topin began. It took less than eight hours for the entire trial, and the jury only had to deliberate for 20 minutes. Jane was found not guilty by reason of insanity. She was sentenced to Taunton Insane Hospital for life. Jane appeared to be overcome with joy about the verdict because she assumed that she would be able to convince the hospital of her sanity and be set free in a few months' time. In addition to this, as a supplement to the New York Journal, William Randolph Hearst typed up Jane's confession. In this document, Jane admitted that she wanted the panel of psychiatrists to find her insane. It was later discovered that Jane had confessed to her defense lawyer and longtime friend, James Stewart Murphy, that she had committed more than 31 murders. Upon convincing them of this lie, she felt very smug in knowing that she had outsmarted a panel of experts. Jane described the exquisite pleasure it gave her to kill her patients, and she marveled at the lack of feeling and remorse she felt for doing these horrible things in an attempt to show that she was not without feeling. Jane claimed that the jilt she received from the lover in her youth seemed to be the root of all of her problems. Jane explained, If I had been a married woman, I probably would not have killed all those people. I would have had my husband, my children, and my home to take up my mind. June 24th, 1902. Jane checked into her new home. For three and a half decades, Jane's mental state slowly deteriorated. For a time, she refused to eat any of the food at the hospital because, ironically, she thought that the food had been poisoned. As the years passed, Jane became a quiet old lady who did not cause any trouble. August 17, 1938. Jane died of old age at Taunton Insane Hospital. In what was to be her last interview, Jane told the reporter, This was my ambition, to have killed more helpless people than any man or woman who has ever lived. 